Welcome to NTD News Today. I'm Kevin Hogan. Let's take a look at our top stories. China conducted live-fire missile drills in the waters near Taiwan just one day after House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visited the island. Taiwan and the White House have responded. The IRS still has a massive backlog of unprocessed tax returns despite a boost to its budget. A senator wants to know why. A Boston subway line is closing for a month for track maintenance and repair. The line has been plagued with problems, including with some of its new subway cars that were made in China. A Christian flag flies over Boston City Hall after a five-year legal battle. A Christian charity says it's a hard-won victory. China fired multiple missiles into waters near Taiwan as part of a four-day military exercise. This comes just one day after House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit to the island. Here's that story. Following House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's Wednesday visit to Taiwan, China held live-fire drills off the island's eastern coast. China state television showed footage of multiple rounds of missiles being launched from ground positions. According to Beijing, the drills will last from August 4th to 7th covering six areas around Taiwan. Some of those areas overlap with parts of Taiwan's territorial waters. From Pingtan Island in China's Fujian province, Chinese tourists witnessed the missiles launch into the sky. Taiwan's defense ministry has confirmed that as of 4 p.m. local time Thursday, a total of 11 Dongfeng missiles landed in the waters northeast and southwest of the island. The ministry posted on Twitter that we condemn such irrational action that has jeopardized regional peace. Chinese state media said the exercises are the largest Beijing has ever conducted in the Taiwan Strait. The Taiwanese government says it has activated its defense systems and increased its combat readiness. In light of the current scenario, our government will not only actively strengthen its self-defense capabilities, but will also maintain close ties with like-minded countries like the United States. Together we will defend the rules-based international order avoiding further regional escalation, while vigorously protecting the security of the Taiwan Strait and the freedom, openness, peace and stability of the Indo-Pacific region. Meanwhile, the White House denounced Beijing for using Pelosi's visit to impose military coercion on Taiwan. There's no reason for Beijing to turn this visit, uh, uh, you know, which is consistent with our policy, into some sort of crisis or to use it as a pretext uh, to increase aggressive military activity in or around the Taiwan uh, Strait. During his visit to Cambodia, Secretary of State Antony Blinken says the U.S. opposes unilateral efforts to change Taiwan's status quo, especially by force. We in countries around the world believe that escalation serves no one and could have unintended consequences that serve no one's interests, including ASEAN members uh, and including China. Secretary Joni Ernst tweeted that communist China cannot dictate where we go or who we talk to. She said China's, quote, retaliatory measures need to be met with strong U.S. leadership to reinforce our rock-solid partnership with Taiwan. Japan's defense minister says five of the ballistic missiles launched by the Chinese regime near Taiwan have landed in Japan's exclusive economic zone. He says the missiles fell into waters to the southwest of Hateruma Island in Okinawa Prefecture. Japan staged a diplomatic protest over the move. Japan's defense minister recorded nine missile launches in total, two less than the number reported by Beijing and Taiwan. Japan said four of the missiles flew over Taiwan before landing in Japanese waters. Experts say Beijing's military drills are not just focused on the U.S. and Taiwan, but are meant to send a signal to Japan as well. The Chinese military drills encompass an area that would be traversed by the U.S. and Japan in the event that they come to the aid of Taiwan if Beijing attacks. A Russian court today sentenced U.S. basketball star Brittany Griner to nine years in prison. That's after finding her guilty of deliberately bringing cannabis-infused vape cartridges into Russia. Her sentencing could pave the way for a U.S.-Russia prisoner swap that would involve the 31-year-old athlete and a Russian imprisoned in the U.S. who was once a prolific arms dealer. Greiner earlier pleaded with a Russian judge not to end her life with a harsh prison sentence before breaking down in tears in court. The Russian prosecutor called for Greiner to be sentenced to nine and a half years if she was found guilty of bringing illegal drugs into the country. 
Greiner was detained at a Moscow airport on February 17th with vape cartridges containing cannabis oil in her luggage. She pleaded guilty, but said she neither intended to bring a banned substance to Russia nor to hurt anybody. In a major rebuke to Russia, the U.S. Senate on Wednesday overwhelmingly voted to let Finland and Sweden join NATO, bringing the two countries a step closer to joining the 30-member alliance. On this vote, the yeas are 95, the nays are 1. The Senate easily surpassed the two-thirds majority required in the 100-member chamber to ratify Sweden's and Finland's entry documents. Senators from both parties strongly endorsed their membership into the U.S.-led alliance. Minnesota Democrat Amy Klobuchar spoke before the vote. Russia's unprovoked aggression in Ukraine has changed how we think about the world's security. That's why I strongly support the decision of these two great democracies, Sweden and Finland, to join the most important and defensive alliance in the world, NATO. Missouri Republican Josh Hawley was the lone vote against the motion. Expanding NATO will require more United States forces in Europe. More manpower, more firepower, more resources, more spending. And not just now, but over the long haul. Our foreign policy should be about protecting the United States, our freedoms, our people, our way of life. And expanding NATO, I believe, would not do that. Helsinki and Stockholm applied for membership after Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February. Moscow has repeatedly warned both countries against joining the alliance. Up until now, the two have been able to participate in NATO meetings and have greater access to their intelligence. But they are not protected by Article 5, which states that an attack on one NATO ally is an attack against all. Last month, all 30 NATO allies signed the accession protocol. And once all members ratify the decision, the pair will become the newest members of the nuclear armed alliance, as well as be protected under Article 5. But ratification could take up to a year. However, it has already been approved by a few countries, including Canada, Germany, and Italy. Are you still waiting for the IRS to process your tax return? Despite having its budget boosted by $2 billion last year, the agency has a backlog of more than 24 million unprocessed returns. A Republican senator is asking the agency why. Here are the details. Republican Senator Ron Johnson of Wisconsin wrote a letter to IRS Commissioner Charles Reddick on Monday, saying he continues to receive hundreds of complaints from Wisconsinites waiting for their 2021 returns and are still waiting on their 2022 returns. The senator says, My constituents' frustration is confirmed by watchdog and press reports that the IRS continues to struggle in processing returns in a timely and efficient manner. He cited the latest report of national taxpayer advocate Aaron Collins, According to the report, as of May 27th this year, the IRS had a paper backlog of 10.5 million individual returns and 7.4 million business returns. Additionally, the IRS still needed to classify 3.4 million returns as individual or business returns. The number of unprocessed returns this current year is 8.8 million more than the year before. The backlog comes despite Congress granting more than $2 billion in additional funding to the agency last year. The IRS commissioner said last year that the additional funding would allow the tax agency to catch up. In his letter, Johnson wrote the IRS does not hesitate to penalize and fine taxpayers for late filings and payments, yet it does not hold itself accountable when it does not process taxpayers' returns in a timely manner. This is not acceptable to Wisconsinites and all taxpayers. Johnson's letter comes as the Senate is poised to vote on a new bill that would grant the IRS an additional $80 billion in funding. Deadly accidents and other major problems in Boston's subway system. Now a subway line will shut down for a whole month. Officials say repairs have to be made now. Here's that story. The Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority, or MBTA, announced that the Orange Line is going to shut down completely from late August until late September. According to Massachusetts Governor Charlie Baker, this will speed up repairs tremendously. The 30 days of 24-hour access to rebuild and replace tracks across this line will replace what would have taken five full years of weekend and evening diversions. Officials say this closure comes after the Federal Transit Administration reviewed the Boston system and directed the MBTA to speed up repairs. Although the month-long closure might accelerate construction, one Boston resident called in at the MBTA board meeting telling them the closure's effect will be felt by thousands. Make 100,000 people a day who take that line take other options. Um, people are going to lose their jobs. 
businesses are not going to have um, a full staff to run their businesses. People aren't going to be able to get to medical appointments. People aren't going to be able to get to see friends and family. Uh, this is just totally unacceptable. A Massachusetts state representative agrees, calling the closure disgusting. It's not the first time the Orange Line is experiencing major problems. The Orange Line's new fleet is made by a Chinese state-owned company, CRRC. The Chinese company is under a nearly $1 billion contract to deliver over 400 cars to the MBTA over the next few years, replacing older cars. Since they were first installed in 2019, these cars have failed multiple times. Last year, a train with over 100 passengers derailed. Boston's red line is also being replaced with Chinese cars. Just this year, a red line passenger died after his arm got caught in a closing car door. It took a Christian charity five years and a lengthy legal battle to be able to fly a Christian flag at Boston City Hall. They finally did on Wednesday after the Supreme Court ruled in their favor and Boston updated its flag policy. Here are the details. A Christian charity known as Camp Constitution flew a Christian flag on the Boston City Hall flagpole for the first time after being denied by the city in 2017. After a five-year legal battle, the Supreme Court ruled unanimously in May that the city of Boston violated the Constitution by refusing to fly the Christian flag while granting permission to secular flags. For 12 years, there were 284 applications, not a single denial, virtually no review. And the only reason why Camp Constitution's request to fly this flag was denied was not because of the flag itself. The symbol itself could have flown. It was how shirtless view of that flag. It was because of one word in the application, the word Christian, that preceded the word flag. Hal Shirtleff, the director and co-founder of Camp Constitution, spoke at the flag-raising ceremony on Wednesday. We're so pleased for this day. Back in 17, we wanted to have a simple ceremony to commemorate the uh, Constitution Day and Boston's rich Christian history. But I do want to give the glory to God because God's hand was in this from the very beginning. Around 200 people attended the flag raising ceremony. One of the speakers was Harry Mahet from Liberty Council, the organization that represented Camp Constitution in the lawsuits. Having grown up in a communist country, in communist Romania, having witnessed a government that was determined to stamp out religious expression from the public square at all costs. My friends, I have to tell you that we need to do anything and everything in our power to make sure that free speech and free exercise of religion always remain free and protected in this great land of ours. Boston updated its flag raising policy on Tuesday following the Supreme Court decision. They now say that a city council resolution or mayoral proclamation will be required for a flag to be raised, and that the city will comply with the Supreme Court decision. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. Coming up, volunteers travel across eastern Kentucky to help residents displaced by severe flooding. The floods swept homes off their foundations and killed at least 37 people. And travel industry experts say despite inflation and fears of a recession, travel demand is soaring. Several factors play a part. Find out why after the break. Senator Tim Scott of South Carolina is introducing a bill to tackle challenges in the country's education system. He aims to make sure government money for COVID relief is actually reaching students and benefiting them. Our next guest is a school choice advocate. He explains the impact the pandemic had on students and whether Senator Scott's bill can help. Here to talk more about the school funding debate is Walter Blanks, Jr., who is the press secretary of the American Federation for Children. Thanks for coming on the show again, Walter. Thank you so much for having me. It's good to see you. I would like to talk about Senator Tim Scott's new bill in which he references the so-called learning loss crisis. Can you first explain what that is? Yes. So right now, coming out of the pandemic across the country, um, countless students are suffering from the effects of COVID and having schools shut down for almost two years. Uh, We see in some communities that students are 13 to 15 months behind um, from before uh, the beginning of the pandemic. And when we look at, especially in lower income communities, the the impact and the effect that that has uh, long term, you know, for the rest of their lives. Um, A few studies have shown that it's estimated that those families will will earn 
on average, uh, $80,000 less in their lifetime from this short period of, of being locked out of schools. And so students are behind and parents are fed up and, and trying to figure out ways to really um, get out of this learning loss crisis. Definitely something that needs to be addressed. Now, Senator Scott alleges money from the American Rescue Plan is not being spent, and therefore it's not helping kids recover from these setbacks due to the pandemic. Do you think funding students and not systems in this case can help? Oh, absolutely. Uh, Funding uh, students is really the only way uh, to fix this issue, especially when you have 93% of those COVID dollars that were meant to to help children caught up, be caught up, uh, haven't been spent yet. And so it's all locked up within the the school districts and and the bureaucrats uh, have control over it. I think the best way to alleviate some of these issues is unlock that funding and give it to parents and students so they can ultimately make the best decision for them. There are a lot of great schools out there right now that uh, are catering to a lot of these learning loss issues and parents don't have access to them because they cost money. And so unleashing those funds, once again, 93% of COVID relief dollars have not been spent um, as of May this year. And so I think it's time to to give that re- those resources to parents and families and let them decide what's best for them. Walter, do you have any idea why this money hasn't been spent yet? Uh, well, I, I personally believe that it was uh, a power play um, from from the unions and, and other special interest groups to, to hoard the funds and, and, and to have control over the funds. Um, but now, as we've seen over the past two years, that, that parents need to be in control and, and students need opportunity and access now. And with, with the money not being spent, right, it makes you wonder, one, where is it going and why isn't it being spent, right? This crisis that we're having, this learning loss crisis, um, is it really that important, right, that, that parents need, need to be able to utilize this money now? And so um, not sure why. That's a question for uh, the bureaucrats and, and, the, and the, uh, the school district leaders, but it's time to, to open up that money to parents and families. Something to look into. Now, what do you think? What is this money used for exactly? Can you break this down? Yes, so uh, with Senator Scott's bill, um, the money can be used for additional uh, educational resources. So that can be um, tutoring, uh, private school tuition, um, school supplies, whatever um, that child may need um, extra to to help get them out of this out of this learning loss. And I personally believe that it gives parents the 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 most flexibility when it comes to school choice um, because they can really tailor and divert those funds to whatever that child may need. And so what one child may need, um, the other may may not need that or need something completely different. And so um, the, the education system is not a one size fits all model. And this form of legislation really opens the doors um, to opportunity for parents to really um, have the flexibility to choose, you know, what each child may need according to their own individual learning needs. Well, we'll see if this bill gets off the ground. Walter Blanks, Jr., American Federation for Children, thank you so much for your insight on this. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. The American Rescue Plan sent $122 billion to K-12 through schools. That money could be lost if it's not used by the September 2024 deadline. The fact that this money hasn't been spent is reflected by some districts announcing layoffs for this school year. That's according to edweek.org. Blanks mentioned the role unions are playing in the allocation of the funding. Some unions are asking tough questions as to why these layoffs are on the horizon. On Wednesday, police in Richmond, Virginia, dropped charges against two men who were arrested for allegedly plotting a mass shooting over the 4th of July holiday. The Commonwealth's attorney for the city of Richmond said on the same day that her office asked federal authorities to take over the case. She said that since the two suspects are illegal immigrants with guns, she wants them to be prosecuted at the highest level. The two illegal immigrants from Guatemala were arrested in early July. That came after an anonymous person overheard a discussion about carrying out a shooting at an Independence Day celebration in Richmond. Volunteers have fanned out across eastern Kentucky to help residents displaced this week by severe flooding. The floods swept away homes and vehicles and killed at least 37 people. NTD's Andrew Thomas has more. Lisa Allen and her family drove around Perry County distributing food and water to flood victims. Allen's foster child, A.J. Burchett, described the aftermath of the flooding. As we're going through here, you'll see a bunch of devastations. There's houses that are torn up and that are not even on their foundations anymore. Despite the conditions, the arduous task of cleaning up and rebuilding was well underway on Wednesday. Burchett and Allen delivered food to the flood victims. 
So there's all this stuff in here. There you got granola bars, noodles, canned food. We got some pancake mix, some just food in general, because we're going out and delivering all this food for everybody that needs it. All these bags are full, fill up with the same stuff. They were also equipped with a variety of other provisions. We got plates, spoons, water, Gatorade, some chips and gummies and stuff. We got diapers in there and baby stuff for anybody who needs it. We're just going through these haulers and stuff. So. Waters had receded and remote areas became more accessible. Mountains of muddy debris, upended vehicles, and homes dislodged from their foundations were common sights. The flood water came so fast on us here on the farm, and we've got 400 acres here. We've been here since 1865, our family has, and we're, uh, we're going to rebuild. We're gonna, we got, we've got homes standing, and, and, and we're going to stay right here in our, our 400 acres. At Hazard High School, students handed out supplies for flood victims. We went out and saw all the flood victims and stuff, and it just broke my heart to see it. And if I can help in any way to somebody who has nothing, if I can give what little I have to somebody, then I want to help. So I just, I, it really helps me to help people. Kentucky Governor Andy Bashir said he expected the toll to increase in the coming days. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. The state of Tennessee has sued Walgreens. It's accusing the pharmacy giant of fueling the state's opioid epidemic by flooding the market with prescription narcotics. The lawsuit says Walgreens used its position as one of the state's largest pharmacy chains to dispense over 1.1 billion oxycodone and hydrocodone pills within Tennessee from 2006 to 2020. That's roughly equal to 175 tablets for every resident of the state. Tennessee has been one of the hardest hit states in the opioid crisis. The lawsuit says the state has documented at least three opioid-related overdose deaths every day. It says Tennessee's greatest jump in opioid dispensing was from 2006 to 2014. That's when Walgreens operated as a wholesale distributor for its own pharmacies. Walgreens has been the target of similar lawsuits in other jurisdictions. In a statement to Reuters, Walgreens' parent company said it will continue to defend itself against unjustified attacks on the professionalism of its pharmacists. Governor Ron DeSantis announced a statewide initiative addressing the harm stemming from fentanyl. He said 70 percent of all overdoses in Florida are due to that potent drug. The state is looking at a model that its own Palm Beach County used to curb addiction. It's going to take that model and expand it to 12 other counties. A statewide director is in charge of the program. She says her goal is to provide resources to people with addiction. Those include 24-7 access to assistance, evidence-based treatment, medical and psychiatric care, and social support. DeSantis said fentanyl overdose deaths have increased nine-fold since 2015, and he said that in 2022, there have been almost 2,000 fentanyl overdose deaths across the state. The mother of slain YouTuber Gabby Petito is partnering with the National Domestic Violence Hotline to help others survive violent relationships. In the month of February, we saw 80,000 contacts reach out to our organization. That is a substantial increase really overwhelming our services. The Petito family reached out to us and said, what can we do? We said, we need to increase the number of advocates. They've made an incredible gift of $100,000 to our organization. Another family um, has contributed $200,000 to our organization. We don't know why people don't report domestic violence there. It's a shame behind it, whatever it is. Um, but they need a safe place to, to go. They need to call the hotline. The anti-violence hotline takes calls from thousands of people each year. Most are women who find themselves in physically or emotionally abusive relationships. Ray Jones says the current average wait time for a counselor is far too long. She hopes to use the recent donations to improve that and then raise even more money for the hotline through a fundraising campaign. The strangled body of Schmidt's 22-year-old daughter was found last September in Wyoming after a cross-country trip turned into a high-profile missing persons case, then into tragedy and grief. Investigators believe her boyfriend killed her. He killed himself in a Florida swamp and left behind a notebook that authorities said contained a confession. Schmidt says she 
that she supports the hotline to help others survive domestic violence in honor of her daughter's legacy. As travelers return to the skies in droves following a pandemic pause, airlines and airports across the world are struggling to meet demand. But are recession fears and soaring inflation impacting that travel boom as consumers weigh airfare, hotel, and gas prices? Here's why the travel industry appears to be thriving amid a possible economic downturn. As the peak summer travel season winds down, travel experts say Americans are still spending money on their vacations, despite historic inflation and recession fears. While consumers are starting to pull back uh, on some discretionary spending, some things they don't have to spend money on, it's not holding true for travel. Several travel industry leaders say demand is still high. Scott Kay, is founder of the flight aggregator website Scott's Cheap Flights, points to several factors, including a rise in credit card travel spending. American Express uh, no- noted that travel spending was up uh, nearly 150 percent in the, uh, the previous quarter. That's despite fears of an economic downturn on the horizon. Experts blame that on so-called revenge travel, the huge travel boom following years of lost vacations during a pandemic slump. Meanwhile, Airbnb says reservations are soaring. On Tuesday, the company announced a 24% increase in bookings in the three months that ended in June, compared to the same time period in 2019. And when it comes to hitting the road, gas prices are declining. On Wednesday, the U.S. national average price of a gallon of regular gas was $4.16, according to AAA. Compared to a month ago, that was $4.81. And experts say cheaper prices are ahead. While motorists may be incentivized by prices that have been falling, more decreases lie ahead. On Wednesday, OPEC, the world's oil exporting countries and its allies, agreed to a tiny increase in production next month amid fears that a global recession will hurt demand. The Department of Transportation is taking action that may calm frustrated travelers. They're proposing rule changes that would make it easier for airline passengers to get flight refunds. Under the previous rules, airlines were only required to pay back ticket charges if there was a significant change to the timing of a plane takeoff. But now the DOT is proposing that passengers could get a refund if their arrival or departure times are moved by at least three hours or if they face other lengthy changes. The summer travel season has been especially tough. The tracking site FlightAware says about 40,000 U.S. flights have been canceled since Memorial Day. And if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, don't hesitate to email us at news.today at ntd.com. And still to come, a Chinese state-owned company is buying a forestry plantation in the Solomon Islands, and that's raising concerns given the strategic importance of the location. And India is on high alert. That's because a Chinese military ship plans to visit one of its neighbors, though China says the ship is only going there to refuel. Find out more right here on NTD News. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, inventor of MyPillow. Thanks to your support, you've helped make MyPillow become one of the fastest growing companies in America. Over the last 12 years, you've helped MyPillow create thousands of jobs right here in the USA. When I got MyPillow, I'm asleep almost immediately. I stay asleep at night and I wake up more well-rested in the morning. That's why I invented MyPillow. My patented fill adjusts to your exact individual needs and helps keep your neck supported and aligned. I'm interrupting this commercial to bring you my BOGO extravaganza. For example, you get one of my Giza Dream bed sheets and you get a second set absolutely free. Or my six-piece towel sets. Buy one set, get another one absolutely free. Or get my classic premium MyPillow and get another one absolutely free. So call the number on your screen or go to MyPillow.com and use your promo code to get my buy one, get one free offers and get deep discounts on all my pillow products. Welcome to RenBiz.com, the education and career program where parents rule. We replace public schools and universities. We are for ages 6 to 100. Never any big student loans with us. You graduate with a traditional diploma, a university degree, and your own family business. Adults returning to obtain better careers. Parents looking for better academic and career opportunities for their kids. 
At Business Acation, you spend 50% of your time on traditional education and 50% on business education, including setting up your own family business. Learning is in your small in-person pods of six to 10 students. At Renaissance Business Acation, AKA RenBiz.com, graduation means you have a degree and your own family business. Like education always should have been, a transition to getting a career. Good to have you back. A Chinese company is eyeing a deep water port and airstrip in the Solomon Islands. That's amid mounting concerns in the West about a potential Chinese military base just a thousand miles from Australia. A Chinese state-owned company is buying a forestry plantation in the Solomon Islands. But when the Chinese delegation visited the island, they asked nothing about the forests. Instead, reports say they were extra curious about the length of the wharf an area where ships dock to load and unload, and the depth of the water. Other than tens of thousands of acres of forest, the plantation also covers a deep water port and a World War II era airstrip. The purchase plan has raised alarms in Australia and allied countries about the Chinese regime's real plan. Beijing has already signed a security agreement with the Solomon Islands, causing panic in the West. And given the island's strategically important location, many have suspected that what the regime really wants is a military base on the Pacific island. In an interview, former U.S. National Security Council advisor Alex Gray explained why the Solomon Islands are so important. I think that if Solomon Islands uh, ends up with a dual-use facility or a permanent base or or some in-between hybrid model that gives the Chinese uh, access, it's going to be the most devastating uh, impact on the security of the first island chain going into the second island chain since World War II. Uh, It will be the greatest threat to Australian national security since 1945. Um, I I don't think you can exaggerate how much of a danger it will be to uh, the alliance structure that the United States has built. The first island chain consists of a group of islands including Taiwan, Japan's Okinawa and the Philippines. It was seen as the first line of defense to contain the spread of Soviet Union influence during the Cold War and now communist China. The second island chain contains U.S. naval base Guam. Gray mentioned that the Solomon Islands are only a few hours flight from Australia and the islands sit astride Australia's sea lines of communication. There's a reason why thousands of Americans died in World War II fighting to keep Henderson Field uh, on Guadalcanal operative because the control of that, that, uh, that island is absolutely critical for Australia's uh, outlet to the wider world. And you know, I, I think there is, a, there is a real, not just Australian national imperative, but an American national imperative from an alliance management standpoint in keeping the Solomons from, from going down this path. As reported by Australian media outlet ABC, the current owners of the forestry plantation are voicing concerns. Taiwanese and Australian shareholders wrote a letter to the Australian government in May, warning that the sale could pose risks or strategic threats to Australia. They say actions are needed to prevent China from taking control of the port and airstrip and establishing a base. A Chinese military survey ship will visit a strategic port in Sri Lanka later this month. China says the ship is going there only to refuel, seemingly to quell worries from India about the situation. Let's take a look. Sri Lanka is trying to reassure its neighbor, India. The country is concerned over Sri Lanka's ties to China and how a Chinese military ship plans to visit a strategic critical port there. Sri Lanka's Hambantota port is known as a classic example of Beijing's Belt and Road Initiative. Some have labeled the Chinese state-run infrastructure program as debt trap diplomacy. Here's how it happened. The Chinese regime lent money to Sri Lanka and helped build the port. After construction was finished, it turned out that the project wasn't profitable, meaning Sri Lanka found itself saddled with a pile of debt. 
and little to no income from the completed project. In order to pay back the Chinese loan, the country's government agreed to rent the port to China for 99 years. Here's the issue. India and some countries in the West have long worried that the Chinese regime plans to turn the port into a military base, making it an inroad for the Chinese Navy to cast its influence into the Indian Ocean. And an upcoming visit of a Chinese military survey ship has ignited those fears. The government carefully monitors any development having a bearing on India's security and economic interests and takes all necessary measures to safeguard them. I think that should be a clear message. But Sri Lanka is telling India not to worry. They say the Chinese ship is just coming there to refuel. For more than 10 years, China has been on a buying spree for seaports around the world. It now owns stake in investments in ports in more than 60 countries across six continents. But those widespread purchases are raising concerns. Studies say Beijing may intend to weaponize these ports. Still to come, human rights organization Amnesty International accuses Ukraine of violating humanitarian laws during Russia's invasion. Find out what it's doing. And folk arts and crafts companies struggle to survive in a region of Russia about 250 miles east of Moscow. The artisans contend with sanctions as well as rising inflation. We'll have all that and more for you in just a minute. The first grain ship to leave a Ukrainian port in wartime passed through the Bosphorus Strait on Wednesday. It's on its way to Lebanon for a delivery that foreign powers hope will be the first of many to help ease a global food crisis. It comes as the Ukrainian president struck a cautious tone about the shipment. Here are the details. The first grain ship to leave a Ukrainian port since the Russian invasion cleared another hurdle on Wednesday, passing through the Bosphorus Strait. The hope is that the closely watched ship will be the first of many to help ease a global food crisis. But Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky played it down. He said the shipment is just a drop in the bucket compared to what's needed. The Rizzoni left Odessa on Monday, heading to Lebanon with nearly 30,000 tons of corn. By Wednesday, the ship had cleared a key inspection by Russian, Ukrainian, Turkish and UN personnel. Its departure comes after Turkey and the UN brokered a grain and fertilizer export deal between Moscow and Kyiv last month. The agreement marked a rare diplomatic breakthrough in a drawn-out war of attrition. Ukraine's infrastructure minister says 17 more ships are loaded and waiting for the green light to set sail. As for the Rizzoni, Ukraine's ambassador to Lebanon says it's expected to arrive in Tripoli within five days. Amnesty International is accusing the Ukrainian armed forces of violating humanitarian law. The human rights organization says Ukrainian forces set up bases and operated weapon weapon systems near schools and hospitals. They were established in populated areas when alternative locations were available. Amnesty says being on the defensive doesn't exempt Ukraine from humanitarian law. The group spent weeks investigating strikes across Ukraine. Folk arts and crafts companies are struggling to stay afloat in one region of Russia. Now artisans are having to cope with sanctions as well as rising inflation on top of the fact that they're still reeling from the pandemic's impact on the economy. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the details. Kokloma painting is one of the most famous folk crafts in Russia. Its origin is associated with the Old Believers, a religion practiced by Eastern Orthodox Christians. Due to sanctions imposed on Russia, sales volumes have fallen, while imports are close to zero. While foreign exchange earnings from exports of our enterprise used to be higher than that of the central bank in the Nizhny Novgorod region. Compared to the pre-pandemic situation, sales have fallen by 40 percent, while exports have fallen by almost 95 percent. Folk arts and crafts companies are struggling to survive. Many are on the verge of bankruptcy. The pandemic was already a big hit due to the cancellation of exhibitions and fairs and the absence of tourists. Now it's sanctions, inflation, and the resulting decrease in local demand. Right now, folk crafts simply need to survive because the situation is very tough not only in folk crafts, but also in our country. We need to survive. This is the most important thing. And we very much hope that all the actions of the government of the Nizhny Novgorod region, the government of the Russian Federation, 
will be directed precisely toward the survival of the enterprises. The head of the Kokloma Painting Factory put forward an initiative to run a day of folk crafts. Artisans from Russia's Nizhny Novgorod region got together to showcase and sell their products. Andrei Vasilenko is a clay sculptor. Events like this are a real opportunity for him. If there were more such events, it would be good. In fact, I would advise the authorities to create a kind of free market for artisans to trade not some kind of obligations to set up outlets, but free sites, so that people like me would only pay for garbage disposal there for public services. Yeah. Another problem comes in the form of low wages. Workers in the industry earn between $265 and $355 per month, which is not enough to attract younger talents. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. If you have any news tips or feedback for the show, don't hesitate to email us at news.today at ntd.com. And coming up, in Britain, security concerns over mailed out ballots delay a conservative party vote for a new prime minister. Some say hackers could have changed votes. Find out who is predicted to win. And drought and heat threaten crops in Italy. The country could see a drop in grape and olive growing, affecting Italy's famed wine and olive oil industries. Stay tuned for more right here on NTD News. It's just clear as day. The media, whether it's broadcast cable or print media, has become extremely biased. And I started looking online for alternative ways to, to get information. And I saw an ad for a free trial. And I looked at it and I said, Epoch Times? I mean, come on, this is end of days type of stuff? I mean, what are they gonna be talking about here? And I said, well, it's a free trial, let me dig in. Is it giving me both sides? Is it giving me an objective point of view here? I have looked for opportunities to see where they might be biased and I don't find it. It has given me a level of trust in media that I didn't think I'd ever get back. I love the Epic Times because it has renewed uh, my faith in the idea that a reliable, responsible, non-biased source of information is available. And I can say that I love it because of that. Court packing, it's the tool of left-wing authoritarians. Hugo Chavez packed Venezuela's Supreme Court with his socialist cronies, paving the way for his tyrannical regime. Now America's socialist radicals want to pack our Supreme Court with four new liberal justices. Court packing is a coup to take away your constitutional freedoms and to turn America into a socialist country. Don't let them destroy our great republic. Go to supremecoup.com to learn more. You know dragging chains can spark a wildfire? Only you can prevent wildfires. Welcome back. The Conservative Party in Britain has delayed sending out ballots for its leadership contest. It comes after an alert from the UK's intelligence agency. Ballots were due to be mailed this week to 160,000 Conservative Party members who will be casting their votes for the next Prime Minister. NTD's Jane Worrell is in London with this report. Well, the fate of the next Prime Minister lies in the hands of around 160,000 Conservative Party members. They were expecting to receive their postal ballots this week, but this has been delayed following a security warning from the UK's intelligence agency, that's GCHQ. Now, this is interesting because the Conservative Party originally had intended to let members cast their votes with an option to change their vote later if they change their mind before the 2nd of September deadline. And the rules of the leadership contest would have meant that only their second vote would have counted. But this delay means that each member will now receive a unique code and only one 
unchangeable vote. This option um, from the Conservative Party that would have meant that people could have changed their vote later could have left a loophole for hackers to change people's online votes. The Telegraph, who first reported this story, said there was no specific threat from a hostile state and concerns were around the vulnerability of the voting process. Members can cast their ballots either online or, or um, in person. Now, we, we've got a statement from the National Cyber Security Centre, which I'm going to read out, and they're part of GCHQ. They said, defending UK democratic and electoral processes is a priority for the NCSC, and we work closely with all parliamentary political parties, local authorities and MPs to provide cyber security guidance and support. As you would expect from the UK's National Cyber Security Authority, we provided advice to the Conservative Party on security considerations for online leadership voting. And a Conservative Party spokesman sent us this statement. We have consulted with the NCSC throughout this process and have decided to enhance security around the ballot process. Eligible members will start receiving ballot packs this week. Now, a YouGov poll now shows that Liz Truss is ahead of Rishi Sunak in the polls. She now has a 34-point lead over him. So for Rishi, Rishi Sunak, he'll be hoping that he can gain new ground over the next few days before those first ballots are cast. Jane Worrell, NGD News, London. Severe heat and drought is threatening Tuscany's famed crops of olives and grapes. Growers say the heart of Italy's wine and olive oil industry could see a sharp decline in production this year. Here's more. Farmers in Tuscany, the heart of Italy's wine and olive oil industry, are battling to salvage this year's crop from the ravages of drought and heat waves. The lack of rainfall since spring has affected even plants that thrive in hot and dry conditions. In San Castiano, near Florence, the soil, parched by the scorching sun, is not producing enough olives. Without water, many flowers fall to the ground before becoming oily fruit. Grower Filippo Legnauli fears oil production this year could drop by as much as 50 to 60 percent. We expect a poor season in terms of quantity of olive production. Unfortunately, climatic issues have a decisive influence. We had a very dry spring with practically no rainfall from March to today, and this happened at a crucial time during the transition from flower to fruit. We had excellent flowering, but unfortunately, the lack of water hindered the process. In Castellina, in Chianti, September is normally the month of the grape harvest, as it is throughout the country. But with extreme and prolonged temperatures, the bunches of grapes have ripened earlier than expected. Sergio Zingarelli is vice president of the Chianti Classico Forum. We have smaller grapes, and we expect the number of grapes to be lower than the average of the last few years, probably in line with last year's. Now we have to wait and hope for good rainfall because the vineyard cannot reach the harvest without rain. We hope for healthy, abundant rainfall, even staggered in two or three waves. A few years ago, olive trees and vines were mainly the preserve of hot and arid areas such as Sicily. Now even Val d'Aosta in the very north, famous for its ski resorts and mountains, can produce its own oil, the farmers say. A record amount of seaweed has invaded the Atlantic Ocean this year, smothering Caribbean shorelines from Puerto Rico to Barbados. Tons of brown algae are killing wildlife, choking the tourism industry and releasing toxic gas. The University of South Florida's lab that studies marine science says more than 24 million tons of a type of brown algae blanketed the Atlantic in June. That was up from 19 million tons in May. The lab said this was a new historical record. Scientists say there needs to be more research to determine why levels of this brown algae in the region are reaching record highs. Possible factors include a rise in water temperatures and fertilizer and sewage waste fueling algae blooms. Researchers say large masses of seaweed can have a severe environmental impact. Decaying algae could alter water temperatures and lead to declines in seagrass, coral reef, and sponge populations. And in Iceland, the meteorological office says a volcano has erupted near the country's capital after days of rising earthquake activity in the area. 
Aerial video shows lava and smoke spewing from a fissure on the side of a mountain. The same mountain saw an eruption last year that lasted six months. Authorities told tourists and residents to avoid the area due to poisonous gases, although there was no immediate risk of damage to critical infrastructure. A code red was declared to stop airplanes from flying over the site, although helicopters were sent in to survey the situation. The peninsula is a volcanic and seismic hotspot. The outbreak took place just 15 miles from the country's capital and less than 10 miles from the nation's international airport. What's more, in March last year, lava fountains erupted in the area and continued until September. The site attracted thousands of Icelanders and tourists to the scene. And just ahead, a shortage of veterinarians in remote areas of Australia makes it difficult for people to access the care their animals need. Vets often travel long distances to treat pets. We'll have all that and more for you in just a minute. For many Australians, life wouldn't be complete without a pet, but a shortage of vets in remote areas is making it difficult for people to access the care their animals need. And today's Andrew Thomas has more. This dog is having a minor medical procedure. It's one of many that happen every day at this vet clinic in Port Lincoln on South Australia's Air Peninsula, but it isn't always easy. I don't think people understand, but we are on call 24-7. These daily pressures have been compounded by a national shortage of vets with an acute impact in regional Australia. It's pretty sad, really. Like, it's hard for those people, particularly if they've got an emergency. You know, a lot of things can't wait that long. So there's a lot of people with animals out there in remote and rural areas that just don't have, uh, you know, immediate access to veterinary care. The Air Peninsula has two clinics servicing an area covering about 65,000 square miles. Vets often travel long distances to treat pets. It puts us under a bit of strain here, um, but we just feel like it's a service we need to provide to sort of help those people out. Both clinics have had to stop some regional visits because of staff shortages, and fewer staff means it's harder to keep customers happy. We try and be as understanding as we can, but it does get tough when you feel like you're their punching bag uh, a lot of the time. The Australian Veterinary Association is working to increase the number of vets working in regional Australia, including covering education costs for veterinary students. As a profession, we're looking to things like fee forgiveness for educational debt. Um, we're also looking at how can we get uh, families to go out. For these vets on the Air Peninsula, it's the satisfied customers that keep them employed. Seeing your patient that came in critically ill, then leaving the clinic, um, walking out with a wagging tail is always the best part. <laughs> Andrew Thomas, NTD News. The record for the longest torta sandwich was broken during the 17th annual torta fair in Mexico City. The fair's attendees were able to taste a piece of the 240-foot-long torta. The time recorded also was broken at the event, with the torta being assembled in two minutes and nine seconds. The sandwich had been prepared by cooks whose businesses participated in the fair. For torta cooks, the fair provides an opportunity to generate profits and promote their business. Such is the case of Rosa Ventura, who had to close her physical seafood torta store due to the pandemic. Different from the traditional sandwich, the torta is bigger in size and can be made up of a variety of products. Each section of this record-breaking torta had a different flavor, and each section represented flavors that local cooks have created over the years. And back in Kansas, some roofers are surely in serious regret after tearing off the roof of the wrong home. The owner, Stephen Cornspan, rushed to the house Monday morning after his renters heard banging. When he got there, his roof was mostly just a wooden frame. No workers were there, but they left a pile of shingles on the ground. Cornspan contacted his police and his insurance company. He was able to get in contact with the roofing company. The owner says the men will be fired. He also offered to cover the cost of fixing the roof. Cornspan says it was fixed Tuesday and cost about $6,000. Overland Park police are treating the incident as a civil matter. And now over to Hawaii, where an environmental nonprofit collected close to 100,000 pounds of marine debris from reefs and beaches. They just finished a 27-day cleanup expedition that began in July. 
the Marine Debris Project team sailed through the uninhabited islands in the northwestern waters of Hawaii. Along the way, they collected nets, documented the area's wildlife, and bundled up huge piles of debris to haul it away aboard a cargo ship. Crew members gathered 86,000 pounds of ghost nets from a single reef in that area. Ghost nets are large tangled masses of lost or discarded fishing nets made of plastic. They impact the coral colonies and other species living on the reefs. Endangered Hawaiian monk seals, sea turtles, sharks, and fish are among the wildlife at risk by this type of marine pollution. And even back on the U.S. mainland, Americans can get some fresh air and spend time in nature without opening their wallets, especially today. In honor of the Great American Outdoors Act, August 4th is a free entrance day for all National Park Service sites. The act passed in 2020. National Park officials say it expands recreational opportunities on public lands. Although there's no charge to get into most of these parks, there are fees for certain activities, including boat launches and camping. You'll still have to pay for those activities today. More information is available at nps.gov. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to put our email address on screen. We'd love to hear from you. For podcasters, that's news.today at ntd.com. Until next time, Kevin Hogan, NTD News, New York City. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.